So we're going to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I thought it'd be useful just to situate where the hell is that place. So it's very far away, and it's a very small piece of land. And keep that in mind as we go through this. That's the easy part. Where is it? Let's turn to the hard part. What is it about? And to do this in uh, what I think is good practice, I asked some people, and I wanted to get a representative sample of the dominant view of what's going on. What is this conflict about? So I asked four ordinary Americans for their opinion. And I think they're representative. So you might argue sampling bias, something like that. But I think these are representative of the American, the dominant view. And when I say dominant, I mean it's shaped the way people think about it, and specifically American policy. Four ordinary Americans. <laughs> and on the face of it, let's agree, on the face of it, they're quite different, right? And particularly these two guys. You, does it get any more different? I mean, the, there's really heated battles over what they stand for. Now, it might surprise you to hear that they actually have a very similar view of the conflict. Now, it comes out in the way that they think it needs to be solved. So I want to illustrate that and then peel back a layer to, to reveal what is the basic assumption, what, what's really going on here. So let's begin with President George Bush. Whatever you think of him, or if you don't want to think of him, that's fine too. Uh, he is now seen, and rightly seen in some respects, as the most friendly president towards Israel in recent memory. Academics think that, if you read the literature. Commentators think that. George Bush thinks that. And a lot of people who are on the side of Israel think that too. Now, he is also the first president in American history to put down as official policy America's support for a Palestinian state. And he went further. He, he was emphatic. It's long overdue, and we have to do everything we can to make, make that goal a reality. So his idea is, well, the Israelis obviously have a right to their society and their state, but the Palestinians also have some legitimate claims. So they, there's some, some argument on both sides. Now, Obama is a little more articulate on this point. Each side has legitimate aspirations. And peace entails, now this is the sort of uh, magic formula, two states for two peoples. Now, if you peel back this bipartisan view, and it, doesn't, and it goes farther back than George H.W. Bush, if you peel back that idea of a two-state solution, what you really get are these two assumptions about the conflict. There are two peoples, and there's one piece of land. What do you do about that? Well, you give them each a state. Okay, that's the premise, but what underlies that premise? Well, what underlies it is the idea that they each have some legitimate claims, even if we don't think they're fully right. A key premise is that neither side is completely wrong, no, completely right. So we have to find a middle way. And hence, the, the ultimate expression of that middle way is the so-called two-state solution. We give them each a little bit of land, and we kind of split the difference. And there's all kinds of formulas and a lot of ink spilled on what exactly that formula looks like and how much land, who gets what. What I want to suggest to you today, and I'm just curious, has anyone heard the idea that it's a conflict between two peoples over one piece of land. Is that anybody? Show of hands. Has anyone heard that before? And what about the two-state solution? Have anyone, has anyone heard? Yeah. So these are, I mean, you, the fact that you've heard them reveals that they have spread outside the State Department bubble and outside the White House and that the, beyond the world of the policy wonks. I want to suggest to you that this, this entrenched view, is completely wrong. It's wrong both in its factual assessment of what's going on and in its evaluation of the conflict. Because it implied in what I've just described to you as the assumptions here is a negation of judgment, is the idea that you shouldn't judge. 
including from George W. Bush, the moralist in chief, the assumption is that both sides are a little bit gray. Now, there's a bit more gray on the Palestinian side. We think they're, they're a little bit worse. We're not fully comfortable with them. But they also have some things that, as Obama said, there's legitimate grievances on that side. And the Israelis have things that they do that we think are good, but there's also stuff we're not sure we're comfortable with. So there's this kind of, well, we're not comfortable making a judgment. We don't think judgment's really appropriate here. We're going to junk that whole idea of drawing evaluations of the two sides, and we'll just treat them as, well, they're basically gray, morally gray. And hence, we'll just spin out different ways to solve this through the so-called compromise peace process, which you might have heard about. Now, it, that is wrong, it's destructive, and there's no basis for it. I mean, it, it's wrong not just because I think it's wrong, but it's not rooted in reality. The conflict in a superficial sense, let, let's, let's make this a little bit more um, uh, charitable. So, are there two peoples? Yes. Okay. Is there one piece of land? Yes. I mean, I showed you the map. It's a very small piece of land. That all is true. I'm not disputing any of that. But what you go from there to is a question. What, what, is the, what really is going on here? And the idea that you can proceed on the premise that, well, we're not really going to form a view of either side. We're going to push that away. That is destructive. That, you can call it moral agnosticism. It's wrong. Because fundamentally, this conflict is as stark as you can get in terms of what each side stands for. And far from the solution being a compromise, the appropriate solution, far from that being the appropriate solution, it makes things worse. So, the, the, the idea that we need a compromise presupposes that it's too murky and we don't want to get any deeper into this mud and so we'll just have them kind of split the difference. That is completely wrong. It's not murky and it's, cl it's clear where we should stand. And the way you get that kind of clarity is by starting with a very different view of the role of morality in foreign policy rather than dispensing with it, which is what the conventional view that I've discussed does, rather than dispense with it, throwing it out, you need to bring it in. You need to bring moral judgment into this in order to figure out what's going on, and you need an objective standard. And the one that I'm going to argue for, and that I think is enormously clarifying, is something that I think you're all familiar with, and I'm not going to defend it because I hope you agree with it, and that is this, the idea of freedom, political freedom, or more specifically, the idea of a society in which individuals have rights, they're protected. As I said, I'm not going to defend that this is a good thing. I hope you agree with me. I hope you agree as well that a society that is free is one that enables people, it gives them the, the opportunity to develop their goals and achieve them, to grow prosperous if they can, and actually achieve things with their lives, have control over their future. I'm taking all of that for granted. And the idea that you can prosper and really build something, taking that as a given. Even though I, outside of this room, I know it's not a given, uh, but I, I think it is. It's an important truth. And it's also a cardinal way of evaluating governments and political movements. It is precisely the principle of freedom that we need in order to figure out, well, of the two sides, what do you think of them? What do they stand for? What are they going to achieve in practice? What can they achieve in practice? Because ultimately, a good government is one that protects freedom, and that's an index. It's a measure for judging governments and political movements. So my suggestion today, what I want to illustrate, is when you take the principle of freedom as your standard, and you will recognize that it's true for all people, in all times, in all places, when you judge both sides of this conflict by that standard, it is clear-cut, and that the conflict is not, 
beyond the superficiality of the land and the, and the number of adversaries, beyond that, the, the essential conflict is one between freedom and tyranny. And it's grown even more virulent on the side of tyranny. It is now religious tyranny, as we'll see. So my, that's my argument. I want to start by saying a few words about one of the adversaries, Israel. Now you, how many people here are on campus or have recently graduated by show of hands? Okay, I guess all the students are in one session today. I ask because if you, if you're, if you inhale the air on campus, you will absorb certain views about why Israel stands out. And I'm not going to go into them. If you're interested, ask me about them in the Q&A. But the, the gist of it is, it is the world's most monstrous regime by every possible conceivable standard. Now, that's, I don't think that's true. What I do think is true is, is it does stand out for having virtuous character. It, as a regime, it is a moral regime. It is a free society. So I want to illustrate that by looking at two features of a free society. Now, there's a lot to say about what makes a free society, but I think these are important, and they're familiar. Freedom of speech. We take that as an important value. It's what enables you as an individual to have some control over the future of your society. You can persuade people. You can speak. You can have arguments about what needs to happen. If you can correct problems, it's hard work, <laughs> but you can do it. And it means that the society enshrines the idea that persuasion is the means of reaching other minds, not force. That's the idea here. It's respect for the mind and for the individual's use of it. So the example I'm going to give you, let me just make this less anticlimactic than it's going to be. It's not earth-shattering. A guy wrote an op-ed. OK. <laughs> no refunds. <laughs> He wrote an op-ed. It's, it's a sort of op-ed one of you in this room might have written. He's basically saying the government's too deep into the economy in Israel, and that's a problem. No wonder you have crony capitalism. No wonder you have people on the make. I, I mean, I'm sure you've written letters to the editor on the same kind of or had the thought watching TV. Now, this guy, naturally enough, is not sitting in prison. As, as he should not. He's done nothing wrong. And this is the sort of thing that we take for granted in a free society. You should be able to criticize government and vehemently in order to get other, other people to see that this is wrong. That is an expression of the freedom of speech in Israel. All right? Has anyone heard of this gentleman? This is to bring out the contrast of how unusual that freedom is. This man. Raif Badawi is a citizen of Saudi Arabia, an ally of the United States, as the regimes go. I mean, you can debate whether that's really accurate. Now, he did something even less than the op-ed you saw. He blogged a few times, he tweeted a few times, and he set up a website in Saudi Arabia. The gist of his actions were, you know, we should ask whether Muhammad was really all that divine, and maybe Islam shouldn't dominate every single aspect of our lives. What do you think happened to him? So he is now serving a 10-year sentence. He narrowly missed the death penalty, by the way. He's sitting in jail for 10 years. When he comes out, he will be banned from speaking in any form of media for 10 years. And while he's in jail, he is being, his other punishment is being administered a thousand lashes, 50 at a time. Now, I picked Saudi Arabia not because it's, uh, well, there's lots of reason to pick it, but here's why I picked it as opposed to other countries in the region. Syria is in a civil war. Iraq is in a civil war. Uh, Egypt has had a coup. I mean, it's not, these are not stable regimes. So Saudi Arabia has a modicum of stability. But this is what it looks like. There is no freedom of speech in that country. And that's an important contrast. In Israel, there is. Rule of law, super important. You want the law to be applied to everyone equally, and you want it to be known, you want it to be objective. In Israel, the, the Supreme Court is a, has an unusual role. 
in, it's both an appellate court, but it's also a, a, a court that can challenge the government's policies by being the final arbiter. So I want to give you an example of what that looks like. Now we take our Supreme Court, we hope our Supreme Court has that power still and will push back on government, whatever you think of its recent decisions. But it, that's part of its role. It's a check on government power. So in Israel, in 2002, the government faced a wave of suicide bombings by Palestinians. And the solution they came up with is, we have to build a wall around this perimeter so that Palestinian suicide bombers can neither come in nor climb over. And this was incredibly costly to build. So I, by one estimate I saw it was like a million, sorry, three million dollars per mile. And it was a huge international outcry. You're building a new Berlin Wall. What are you doing? This is terrible. The UN, Amnesty, you know, all the usual suspects are rounding, uh, coming around. Now, it actually had the effect of stemming a lot of the suicide bombers. The reason I mention this story is that along the path of the wall, it went through a number of Arab villages. And a number of families said, what the hell? <laughs> You're crisscrossing my land. You're going to ruin the value of my property. And this is going to impact my life. And so a number of them rounded up some uh, legal help. And they went to the Supreme Court and they said, what the hell? This is going to ruin our property and our lives. We don't like this. And here you have the government arguing we have to have this wall for the sake of the physical security, the, the life and death security of our people, of our citizens. And we think the, the route has to look like this. And the court hearing the arguments, okay, well, but you can't ruin my land doing this. And this is coming from the, the Arab villagers. The court agonized over this. And you can download the court's decision. It's interesting to read. And they ended up saying, well, look, we agree there needs to be a security measure here, but you have to reroute this wall. And they compelled the government to reroute it. So on a very controversial policy, the Supreme Court pushed back on what was a popular decision domestically. I think that represents the idea that even the government is subject to, to checks, which is important. Let me give you one more contrast to this. Can you read that headline? Egypt's courts mock justice with more mass death sentences. Now, this is not the only instance, but if you remember, Egypt has had a coup following the... So the Muslim Brotherhood rose to power through elections, the military overthrew them, and then the military went about, and it's still doing this now, it's purging all the Islamists from Egypt. And a, a, a policeman was killed, and in retribution, the 683 individuals are rounded up and given a death sentence. How 863 people killed one policeman, I don't know. It's possible. Maybe they did something in collaboration. Maybe some of them are Islamists. Maybe all of them are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. But maybe none of them are. What's important here is, is not What's important to me and what should be important to you is the facts of the case. What was important to the court was doing the bidding of the new military regime. This is a classic textbook case of the court taking orders from the government and crushing opponents. And this is not the only case. And if you look at, uh, this is in Egypt and it's the most recent one, Syria, the courts in Syria before the revolution, basically the judges were members of the ruling party. The idea of a court acting independently of the regime is just unknown. This makes a mockery not just of justice, but of the idea of law. One final point. So I've argued and I've taken for granted at the beginning that Freedom is a value in all places and all times, and it, it's what enables people to prosper and to have the opportunity to prosper and to trade and to build things. And so I want to just mention what it looks like economically. So it's great to have freedom of speech, it's great to have rule of law, but these have other consequences on the society. So let me mention one data point on economic 
dynamism in Israel. Now, this is not representative of the entire economy in Israel, because it's uneven. Some sectors are doing better than others, but it's still representative of the degree of freedom that certain parts of the society have. So if you go to the NASDAQ website, you can download a list of all the companies that are listed on there. There are many of them. And you can sort them by size, by capitalization, by country of origin. Naturally enough, the United States ranks first in a number of companies that are based here and listed on the NASDAQ. Then you get China, and then you get Israel. And that, I find that rather inspiring. And I mentioned in the second column what the population size is, because I think it illustrates there's a certain high concentration of people who are really interested in high tech and bio in life sciences, and they're doing really interesting things. Canada, the UK, Germany, France, India, even Korea, they don't rank in the top three. Now, as I said, this, isn't, this is not to say that the economy in Israel is some sort of nirvana where every sector is booming. It's not true, and it's not true that it's uniformly free, but it's free in, in the sense that it's a mixed economy, and I'll get to that, but it's, it's an amazingly vibrant economy in certain sectors. So my argument is this. If we agree that Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, Denmark, France, that we agree that they're basically free. And here, I, let me just make a, a footnote, more than a footnote, an aside. Let me give you an aside. I agree that America, the freedom in America is being eroded and it's severely under stress. We're losing our freedom in America. And nevertheless, we're basically a free society. Even with the masses of regulations, we're a free society. Now, I'd like there to be no regulations. I'd like there to be even greater freedom. But nevertheless, compared to Saudi Arabia, compared to North Korea, compared to even many other European countries, this is a free society. The same is true of the United Kingdom, where I grew up. I know a little bit about France. Same is true there. I know a little bit about Canada. I think the same is true there. They have all kinds of crazy regulations and crazy encroachments on freedom. And Israel has them too. And you can ask me about those in the Q&A. And I think they're, they're really bad. But they do not negate its actual character, its basic character, which is it's still, despite that, a free country. And it's on par with these countries. It belongs in the same category. So I hope somebody does ask me about that, because I think it's important and it, it, it relates to the conflict, but it, we'll get to that if someone asks me in the Q&A. So, so far I've argued that the Israeli side is a basically free society, and I've given you evidence that, to that effect. So I want to turn now to the other side of the conflict, what I call the Palestinian cause. Now, whereas Israel is on par with the Western countries that I put up on the screen just a moment ago, and it's vastly superior to its neighbors in terms of the degree of freedom, the Palestinian cause is essentially a dressed up form of tyranny. And I say dressed up because it, for many of its years, it was presented as a liberation movement. And liberation has a certain meaning, which, if you take it seriously, implies certain things about what they'll do. It is a destructive movement. It is an evil movement. And I say that because I'm applying the standard of freedom. It is a movement calculated to destroy individual freedom and then to destroy a free country. Let me give you some evidence of that. Now, many people think of the Palestinian, this is what you will hear if you study, if you look at the textbooks. Many people think of the Palestinian movement in the way that George Bush and Barack Obama do, which is it's just a bunch of people that are unhappy and they want their own country. What could you have against that? Seriously. They just want to express their national identity and the, you know, the Palestinian cause is their agent. This is the vanguard of that movement. 
And this is the way the Palestinian cause presented itself. For much of its existence, it was seen that way. And some people still insist that that's the truth. We just want a homeland, peeps. Or in the, you know, in the, in the third world lingo, we are liberating ourselves. This is a people's guerrilla movement. We're, we're like the Vietnamese. Well, oh, you're like the Vietnamese. Oh, I, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Now, if you value, if you think that what the Vietnamese were doing is a good thing, then you thought the Palestinian movement was a good thing. And that's part of how it got away with what it was doing. But let me tell you a little about its history, about its origins, and what it actually stands for. So, does anyone recognize the figures on the screen? One of them is Arafat, the guy with the gl this dark sunglasses is Yasser Arafat. Does anyone know him by name? Yeah, it's familiar. Now, the guy in the middle is the reason I put this slide up. That is Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser was the dictator of Egypt through the 50s and 60s. And he saw himself as the embodiment of the Arab nation. What the hell is the Arab nation, you might be asking, which is what I thought when I was studying this history. The Arab nation is a super organism that encompasses all peoples who are Arab. What's an Arab? Well, <laughs> anyone who speaks Arabic, including the Jews who speak Arabic, including the Christians who speak Arabic. No, 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 don't worry about that. It's anyone who's an Arab in a cultural language sort of sense. And the goal of the Nasser movement, the, what Nasser was trying to do is, I will be the embodiment of this movement and I will unite us all. I will take the land that you live on and make it part of the Arab world. And there shall be no gaps in the Arab world. It will be a uniform polity, a, a complete society of Arabs. And in true dictator style, he volunteered for the role of making that come about. What does this have to do with the Palestinian cause? Well, it turns out that Nasser's program involved trying to liquidate Israel, which is his favorite expression for getting rid of it and destroying it so that he and other of the Arab leaders who were colluding with him could have that land. This was the goal, this is the idea of conquest in the name of Arab nationalism. And he would be the lord of all of that. Now, he tried it in 1967. Does anyone know how well that went for him? <laughs> yeah, so it didn't go well. <laughs> Spoiler alert if you haven't read the history. It was a huge humiliation. And this idea of uniting Arabs under a super state, under a, basically a, a, a um, fascist super state, if you want, put it that way in, in, a, in slightly different terms, it didn't go the way he wanted it. And so part of the thinking was, what if we tried something different? What if we put the Palestinians on the stage? Because up until now, they were not part of the conflict. They were not a significant part of what was happening. What had happened up until 1967 was Arab regimes going after Israel in, in various conflicts. And very clearly, for, not for the sake of the Palestinians, they were doing it for the sake of enriching themselves, grabbing more land, and sticking it to their rivals. You can ask me about that if you're interested, particularly in the War of Independence, 1948, that comes up. So what happens is after 67, they're humiliated, and they realize Israel is pretty tough on the battlefield. We're not going to get ahead that way. What if we try this? What if we put the Palestinians up on the stage? We'll cast them as the people's guerrilla movement, the little guy. They're the David. And here's Israel. This is the Goliath. Or to put it in different terms, the Palestinians are now the quintessential underdog. And I put air quotes around underdog because I don't think it's a legitimate way to think of it. But they're the little guy, and Israel's the big guy, and now the Palestinian cause is born. It's the initiative of continuing that goal of conquest and tyranny, but now in a slightly new tactical form. This is what the Palestinian, the, the, the people you saw on the stage, this is what they came up with. They came up with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is a mouthful. What you need to know is that it was an umbrella organization. 
And under that umbrella, these are some of the factions who constituted it. They're basically varieties of tyranny. <laughs> There's Marxist and communist, and I distinguish here for a reason I can explain in a minute. There are pan-Arabists, so these are people holding over the ideal that Nasser was trying to realize. And then the ethnic nationalists who say, there is a Palestinian ethnicity, and it deserves its own nation, and there's a very strong streak of that. And then you get a whole bunch of other offshoots over time. So at a certain point there, are, I think 14 or 15 factions within this goal. Now, you don't need to know all the factions, but what you need to know is why they splintered and what was the common denominator. They basically, the common denominator was, when we win, we'll be the top dog. We'll be, we'll be the ones lording it over other people. And it's going to be a Marxist utopia. No, it's going to be a com No, it's going to be an Arab national. No, it's going to be an ethnic. No, it's going to be the sub, sub, sub version of Marxism that I like. And what happens is they splinter off because the one guy says to the other, you call yourself a Marxist? What the hell do you know about Marx? Look how you're selling out on Marxism. I'm a sellout? Look at you. We did that terrorist operation. What have you been doing? You're sitting around here you're drinking tea. You're the sellout. No, you're the... And then, it, then they basically said, no, no, no. We're the true people's front for liberation of Palestine. No, no, no. We're the general command liberation front. And so you get this splintering off where the, the basic conflict is, you're not militant enough. You're not a true believer in the cause. Or if for some of them this was the problem, you're, you're a secularist, right? You want men and women to live together? So, theoretically, they were committed to the domination of whoever they got control over, and they were committed to violence. The use of force to achieve their end, which is not so surprising when you take seriously what their theoretical goals were. This is a cover of Time magazine, and Yasser Arafat is on the cover, not for the first time or the last time. And this is the sort of glamour of terrorism, basically. And it became a scourge, not just in the Middle East, but beyond. This is a picture of a field in the country of Jordan on a particular week in 1970 when the, the PLO hijacked four planes. Two of them, as you can see here, were landed in Jordan. Now, one of the hostage takers was captured so what do you think they did? They hijacked a fifth plane to try to get it free. As you would, right? I mean, why not? So this becomes, this is a tactic that they adopt, the idea of terrorism, of, of instilling fear and dread. This was not, as you might hear from many sources, this was just, an, the, the, you know, the standard line is this. What do you expect of a people who've been oppressed and frustrated? And this is just their expression of, of desperation, right? I mean, you can, this is actually what people believe. It was not an expression of desperation. It was a calculated policy, both the international versions of their terrorist attacks and their domestic ones within Israel. And the idea was this, having failed on the battlefield in 1967 and in other attempts since then, they came up with this idea that, well, Israel will never stand getting its children, its school children, and toddlers, and, and men, women, and children terrorized in their own streets. They will never tolerate that, and that will cause the society to implode, and then we can take over. This is their stated goal. The goal of the international attacks, the, the sort of hijacking across Europe, that, in part, was to demonstrate to one group and to win the support of others to show how militant they are. You see the smaller factions taking on big attacks in order to demonstrate that they have the capability and that, that they're truly militant. So it's a contest of who is more militant and more 
essentially more vicious. Now, someone might object. I don't think it's a good, well, you can decide what you think of the objection. Someone might say, well, if they had their own state, they wouldn't do all this stuff, and it would be a great place, right? They're saying it's going to be some sort of homeland for people who want it. So how bad, how, well, as people say, what could go wrong, right? What could go wrong? And the, and the way that this is presented is, well, they've never had one, so how, would, how can you tell, right? You're just speculating. Well, it's, we don't need to speculate. You don't need to speculate because a Palestinian uh, sovereign regime or a semi-self-rule regime has existed at least three times in Jordan, in Lebanon, and, and since the 1990s in the Palestinian territories as part of the peace deal. In each case, they basically asserted their dominance. They created a mini-state by which I mean they policed the streets, they asserted their authority, they levied taxes, they claimed to be the, have the monopoly on the use of force, and they subjugated people. They confiscated property, they stole, they intimidated, they expected obedience. I'll mention a little about the Palestinian Authority because that's the case where they had the most authority, the most sovereignty, the most power. One of the first things that the Palestinian Authority did was summon the editors and journalists of the newspapers that were publishing uh, in Arabic, who had been publishing in Arabic under Israeli law and had significant, had basically had freedom of speech. And Arafat's first commandment as the new king, I mean the president of the Palestinian Authority was, if I'm in the newspaper, it better be on the front page and if you're saying something about me, you better clear it with my Politburo. Or in more euphemistic terms, just make sure you're towing the line. And one or two editors made the mistake of not taking him seriously. Their printing presses were burnt down. Their journalists were rounded up and beaten. And I don't mean beaten as in, you know, a couple of slaps on the face. I mean third world kind of police beatings. You know, I won't get graphic. If you owned a house and one of the Palestinian leaders decided that, you know, I actually like that piece of land for my villa, they take it. You know your car? I want to take that. That's mine. And what you get is not one police force, which maybe that would be a good thing if you had a police force, that uniform rules and so on, you had at least eight, and by some estimate, 13 security forces. What does that really mean? What does that translate into English? It means that it was gang rule. Each security force was basically the thugs loyal to one or another faction among the Palestinian leadership. It became, in essence, a new Middle Eastern police state very much like Mubarak's Egypt, but with less money and less power over its people. But still, uh, it reflected the essential goals of this movement, which was to dominate people, to subjugate them, to control them, and exploit them. And to use that as a means to advance his larger goal of getting more territory and more domination and attacking Israel as a means to that end. And if I stopped right here, that would be enough to demonstrate my basic theme, which is the conflict is between freedom on the one hand and tyranny on the other. But that's not the end of the story. So this takes you through 1990s, 2000, early 2000s. And frankly, it's bad enough. I mean, there were Palestinians interviewed around the time Arafat's regime came together in the 1990s, and they were saying to journalists when they could speak freely, I can't wait to get my papers and move to Israel, which just means, you know, a few miles past the border. Why is that? I would rather live in Israel than live under the hell of Arafat. And not that Israel is a bad place, but, it, you know, obviously it's not the Palestinian state that some of them want. 
And even today, and I'll get to this in a minute, but today there are Palestinians who claim to be refugees of the Palestinian Authority. They're fleeing the Palestinian Authority. They're fleeing from Gaza, which is run by Hamas. Why are they fleeing Gaza? Why are they fleeing the Palestinians? Because it is so goddamn terrible. And in particular, and I think the plight of these people is particularly tragic. There is a, a subculture of particularly men who are gay having to flee because they know that it's a matter of time before the police, not the neighbors who are bad enough, but the police will round them up and do horrible things to them. So this is a society that is, it's a new society, and it is perversely, perversely bad. This is what it looks like today, right? The Islamist movement or the jihadist movement is now the dominant ideological force among the Palestinians. All those isms that I described earlier, the Marxist, communists, and, uh, they fell, fell by the wayside. They lost a lot of their credibility over the 1990s and 2000s in, in a significant way. It started, it was a slow burning process. And what came to dominate are the Islamists. And it's significant how they came to dominate because their basic argument was, we embody the moral path. We can justify, we justify the goal of conquest, of destroying Israel, as they put it, frank, uh, frankly. We, we think that's not just for the sake of a Marxist goal. It's not just for the sake of some pan-Arab goal. We all know that's, that's BS. Who believes in that old junk, right? What are you, a holdover Nasserite? What's wrong with you? Clearly, not only is that a doomed approach, it's also impious, right? It's, this is, this is the, the path of unbelief. The path of belief, the path of Allah is jihad. And this is the basic attraction that they can exert. We're doing this not just for the sake of a, 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 a worn-out ism. We're doing this in the name of the good and the just. And no sacrifice is too great, including your own life. Or your children's lives. This is what is the face of the Palestinian cause today. It's another form of tyranny. Now, it's a religious form and an, an, an astonishingly bold, confident form. This is what they were saying during the war last summer. They were saying this and instructing Palestinians to go to the roofs of their homes to act as human shields, voluntarily. I'm not talking about compelled human shields. We're talking about voluntary human shields. Now, the, the other element of this, the other implication of this development in the Palestinian cause is that it, it now situates it in the region in a way that it didn't before. So after the Cold War, there was a lot of turmoil in the Middle East because people didn't know what was going to happen. What's going to, you know, the Soviets are gone. What do, we, what do we have to worry about? What's the new threat? And there was real unclarity. And then there's the Gulf War. Uh, and it, it's clear by the time of the Gulf War in 1991 that, okay, America is the superpower. Nobody better mess with them, right? But what's really happening that America American analysts were not paying enough attention to was the rise of the jihadist movement in the region. And that on a macro scale that was happening with Iran, it was happening uh, in Egypt in, in particular ways, it was happening as well on a macro scale within the Palestinian cause. So what I would suggest to you is that the way to see this conflict isn't just between Israel and in the Palestinians who are now led by Islamists. It is that the, a better term for this conflict is now the Israel-Islamist conflict. Because who is it that is now backing Hamas? 
who, one of the major funders of Hamas, is Iran. It's not the only one, but it's a significant one. So the conflict now, the, the little bitty piece of land over which people are fighting, is a battlefront in a wider conflict between Western freedom and this force of religious totalitarianism on a macro scale and on a mi micro scale. And so it is not, I, don't, I hope it is no longer ambiguous if it was when you, st when you entered the room. It is not murky which side of that divide you should stand on. Nor is it murky why the idea of trying to bring them together into some sort of compromise, sh that should be laughable. It is not yet, but it should be. It should be laughable that you can bring together the Israeli side and, well, who would you bring to the table? I mean, the discredited Palestinian Authority, they don't have any significant following anymore. Or would you bring Hamas in? Now just think about that for a minute. The idea of a compromise between Israel and Hamas. What does it even look like? It, you know what it looks like? It looks like um, a slow motion suicide. <laughs> now I don't think anything like that is on the table. The idea of bringing those two sides is not on the table. But the idea that it hasn't died the idea that this two-state solution hasn't gone away is illustrative of the absence of real moral thinking. Because people get in a certain way that Hamas is beyond the pale, right? I mean, there are some people who, some strange uh, people you wouldn't want to meet or who are reputable who think Hamas has a point. There aren't many, but there are some. Leaving them aside, most people, if you tell them, look, this is what they think needs to happen. This is what their society looks like right now. This is what they tell their children, what they encourage them to do, and this is what they've actually done. Most people would say, yeah, that's crazy. You can't talk to them. But the fact that in, in the realm of how policy is thought about regarding the conflict, it's still conceivable to people in that world that there's some way we can tame Hamas, they will moderate, there's some way we can get them to talk. All of that, and you hear it, and, and there's, it comes and goes in terms of how seriously they float these trial balloons. It is evidence of refusing to think about the character of both sides. It isn't a incidental feature of Hamas that they want Sharia. It is an essential feature. And you can't push that out of mind. So I hope you have some greater clarity on what's really at stake in the conflict, what the divide between the two sides really is and has been, and that this is a conflict over freedom as against the forces that want religious enslavement. And it has implications across the region, it has implications for us, but the key point I want to leave you with is you have to pick a side, and it should be clear which side you stand on if you value freedom. Thank you. I think there's some time for questions, and I, I hope you will have some. I hope, uh, I hope some of what I've said provoked you, and I want to get whatever questions you have. Thank you for your lecture, sir. Uh, you alluded to some crazy regulations in Israel currently and that might have some connection with the conflict. Can you expand on that? Well, thanks for raising that. And I didn't ask him to do that. I, I just, uh, I did ask him. But, uh, so I'm characterizing Israel as a free society, and I think it is essentially that. 
in the same way that America is a free society. So it has pockets of freedom, significant pockets of freedom, and lots of economic regulations and, and uh, political regulations. I, I, rather than give you specific regulations and rules, I would give you two broad categories, and they're very broad, but I'll, I'll illustrate them. One is the relationship between religion and the state. Now, you, you probably all know that Israel regards itself as a Jewish and democratic state. And there's a real tension between the way religion has a role in, in the law. The other category is broadly um, the extent to which individual rights are, are recognized and consistently applied. So there, there's definitely one major exception I would mention uh, just as an example. I think that's the conscription, the military conscription that they practice. I want to emphasize the one regarding religion, though, because I, I don't think that it's properly understood in the West. So the way you hear it, so people who raise it typically raise it in this way. Israel is in the vice grip of religious fanatics, and the country is going to hell. Well, maybe long term it's going to hell, but sort of, it's, on the, it's not on a downward spiral. So I think that's not an accurate assessment. The accurate assessment is there's a fundamental compromise in the, in the wrong sense of compromise between a, a secular government and concessions and appeasing concessions. And they were, they were explicitly thought of that way, explicit concessions and appeasing concessions to certain religious factions so that you have these quirks that the... So, Certain elements of family law are controlled by the rabbinate, the, the bunch of rabbis sitting in a building. So if you want to get married, you have to get it registered there. You can't have a civil marriage. Okay? You can't get a divorce without going through them. And other th weird things like that where they use, so the, the religious groups use their little power in the government to exact all kinds of uh, uh, concessions like that. And they, they're, Try, they're basically parasites on the state, and they want greater power. They want more religion in society. Pushing against that is a society that is basically secular, and a lot of people there think of themselves as Jews, but not in any religious sense, and they don't want this. I mean, one of my cousins wanted to get married, and he doesn't want to go in front of a rabbi. So he goes, where does he go? He goes to Cyprus, like a lot of Israelis, gets a marriage license and comes back. And so, people, so there are people who find it an inconvenience, and then people who see the long-term risk of, okay, if these people who get to sit around studying the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, religious documents, if that's all they ever do, and they get government money to do this, and on top of it, they're trying to inject more religion into society, well, that's a bad thing. So there's a real tension between what we here call church-state issues. It's important to see that the, that's a tension, and it, it goes to the way people think about the conflict. What I don't want to suggest, and I think it's completely wrong, is to think of Israel as a, essentially a, a Jewish theocracy. That is just, that is fantasy. That is a smear, it is not even remotely close. But there really is a tension over the role of religion. It needs to be addressed and resolved. And there are intricate ways that it happened. So those are breaches on its character as a free society. And so is the idea of conscription, which I think I was fortunate, I was unfortunate to be conscripted and fortunate to get out of it. But I know not everyone is. Uh, I have Israeli citizenship. I think that is a horrible thing. It's one of the worst things any state can do to its people is to conscript them militarily. Even if you are in, a, in the Middle East where you are facing all kinds of enemies all the time and you're on a war footing. So I think there, there, in different ways there are tensions between the essential free character of the society and influences that are trying to chip away at that. Um, 
As we speak, the United States is negotiating, air quotes, with um, Iran about nuclear development. Uh, talk about laughable. Uh, I can't imagine why we are negotiating with Iran. We should be giving them an ultimatum, give it up or else maybe we should be bombing them, but that's another story. It has amazed me over the decades Israel's position in this regard, that is, negotiating with an enemy that is intractable and <laughs> impossible. There's the Camp Davids, there's the, you know, all the, all the so-called treaties and, and so on and so forth, which are abrogated before the ink is dry. You've very aptly pointed out how intelligent these people are with the for instance, the NASDAQ uh, example. How can a people, I want to say a nation, how can a people who are so obviously intelligent be so goddamn stupid? I, I don't think the deficiency is in intelligence. Uh, I have, all the people whose work I read who advocate for this are very intelligent. <laughs> Some of them are smarter than I am, and I'm sure of that. I don't think that's the factor. I think there's, we have it in a, we Americans have it in a significant degree, and Israelis have it in a significant degree. And it, this is the basic affliction. It is a lack of moral self-confidence. I mean, if you think of it as an individual, you need self-esteem, self-worth, and, a, and a re, an explicit recognition that you, if someone comes to you, you have a right to defend yourself, you have a right to be protected by the state, that your life matters, and that in a fundamental sense, it's right to assert yourself. That's what an individual needs. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a non-negotiable thing. A, a society needs that in its own way. It doesn't manifest exactly the same way. And it, it, it's necessary if you're looking at the problem and saying, well, these people are trying to kill us and demoralize us through terrorism and through various rocket attacks. What are we going to do with it? Well, we know what we should do, but we don't, we don't think we can do it. We don't think it's the right thing to do. But where does that come from? It comes from a, a void where there should be confidence in the, in the God damn it, you're trying to kill people. You're trying to, you're, you're firing rockets indiscriminately at ho homes and you're blowing up schools full of children, you're, you're ramming buses, you're expl you have, something has to be done. The, as smart as a lot of people in Israel are and as brave as they are, because I think they've faced military battle basically constantly uh, at, with just a few intervals there have been quiet. Even with all that, there is this lack of confidence and it comes from having wrong views about morality. Uh, you, you, I mean, you... But I don't know that any of you will remember this, but you can find tapes of this. About 15 years ago, Iran gave a talk on the rise. He's, I'm pointing to him because he's over there. Uh, he gave a talk on the rise and decline of the state of Israel. And the, the, the thesis of that talk was there was a real decline in the confidence, the social awareness of what is the value of this state. And the decline was precipitous, and it was led by intellectual forces. And one of the m most... Uh, destructive effects of that was the lack of will to fight and to, to believe that they're on the right. And what that opens up is the idea of, well, let's just negotiate. I mean, th let me put it this way, just to broaden the, the point a bit, because you, you implicated Iran as well. And feel free to ask questions about that too. And there's a panel uh, later in the week on foreign policy. If I don't get to your questions, but the, there's an important point about diplomacy and negotiation, which is there are definitely contexts when that's the right thing to do. You can't, but, so you can't dismiss negotiations as a, obviously a wrong thing to do. What is the what is the relevant context that tells you when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, right? So negotiation is a means to an end, right? It's a means to getting to an agreement. So this well. Can an agreement be reached between you and the guy who's trying to kill you? And the second thing is the, the prior question, which is what, what, are we, what do the two sides really want? Like if, you, if you're not thinking about that, if you're evading it, which is a big part of what happens in negotiations today, including with Iran, 
if you're not thinking about that and, and you're actively pushing it out of your mind, well, it seems like the most sensible thing on earth. Who would want to go to war when what you could really do is just sit around, drink tea, and meet in Vienna every couple of weeks at the you know, negotiations? So I think that there's a, a lack of moral confidence. It affects the way people think about solutions and options. And it's one of the drivers. It's not the only thing. But it's one of the drivers behind the peace process in Israel, and, and I think as well now with the, with the Iranians. Um, there's a kind of uh, bankruptcy, moral bankruptcy, that is at the core of it. Uh, given that the nature of the conflict is uh, freedom versus unfreedom, uh, why, why is it that so many ostensibly pro-freedom libertarians are, are at worst uh, uh, hostile to Israel or at, at best indifferent uh, towards Israel? So there's a number of assumptions in the question that I'm not sure I agree with. Uh, and it's not your view. It's, that, uh, it's not clear to me what a libertarian is, because it could mean lots of different things. And it's not a useful term in that sense. That, uh, and, but there are people who define themselves as libertarian. And they, a lot of them are hostile to Israel. And that goes to the other assumption, which is, why do you suppose they're for freedom? I mean, it's, it's not obvious to me that they are, because it is, there are lots of people who think of themselves as libertarians who think that freedom is compatible with anarchy, and it's, it's not. It's, it's false. So there's definitely people who are in this, category, this vague category of libertarian who are neither for freedom nor for any variation of, what, of the term liberty. Now, and they're, the ones who are more on the anarchy side, and even not all of them, some of them who are just, there's this kind of anti-government premise, which, and it's not the best term for it, but it's this idea that government can't do anything right. Maybe it shouldn't do anything. Maybe we don't need it. Maybe it's a bad thing. And it's sort of the agnostic anarchist, if you will. And, well, here is a government that's doing something right, even if it has flaws, and they, how, could you, how could you possibly admire that? Because in my view, this might sound strange, but in my view, you should admire Israel despite all its faults. And I, I'm writing on this, and I have a lot to say about its faults. <laughs> uh, because it, it is a case of a, a group of people who are living in the jungle, basically. All around them is the rule of the jungle, rule of force. And they've managed to carve out a little piece of land and build a life. And some of them are, are doing pretty well, and most of them are better off than they would be anywhere else. That's an achievement. It is, it is what a state should be doing. It should enable people to have the liberty to act. And the people who are against that, well, it raises the question of, do you think a state is good, is a necessary good? I'm not sure many of them do. But then there's another, one more layer I'll, I'll mention briefly, which is, You see this more pronounced on the political left and in many academic circles, which is this. There is a kind of egalitarian slash envy premise. And I'm using those terms in the way Ayn Rand uses them, which is not bringing everyone up to an equal level, but bringing down those who have achieved something. And envy, her, her distinctive meaning of envy is the hatred of the good because it's the good. And we see it all over the place in the United States. I think that that is one of the factors behind sort of the left-wing academic hatred of Israel. And it's, it's not quite admiration for the Palestinian cause, but it's, it's sympathy and encouragement of it. Because it's not, I mean, there are people who admire it, but the more mainstream view is that they have a point and they deserve our hearing. And, when you really get into the details of what Palestinian the cause really stands for, and I've illustrated just sort of the outlines of it here, and the way the culture has developed as a distinct cultural phenomenon, it's beneath contempt. I'm not speaking, I'm not smearing a whole group of people. I'm saying as a culture, any culture that reveres suicide bombers or any kind of terrorist who is doing the act expressly to destroy the morale of 
that is a corrupt culture. When television programs for children talk about, this is how you would slaughter a Jew if you found one. This is what you should do to George Bush if you had a chance. Not that I'm a fan of his, but I certainly wouldn't want to wish upon him the kind of fate that they're instilling in their children. When you indoctrinate generation after generation in the idea that, there's, that you should commit violent acts against people who are not your own, that is a really, that, how is that different from the KKK? It isn't, I mean, it's not fundamentally. How is it different from what ISIS is doing? It's a matter of degree. Yeah. Yes, uh, this may be more appropriate for the foreign policy panel, but I'll let you tell me. You, you had mentioned Iran and their role in supporting Islamic Jihad. And my question is, um, because of the, the nature of supporting, whether it be financially, but not so much directly on the, on a, on a, as an Iranian attack in per se, my question is what, in your opinion, should be done now in relation to Iran, and, and, and B, how could that be communicated effectively? And, and the third part of that is with increased terrorist activity and free speech attacks, could that, due to that increased activity, could that make the public more receptive to a, a proposed action? So you've asked me a multi-part question, which I, I want to answer, but I think I'd like to answer the, the foreign policy discussion, if you're able to attend that. Yeah. I'll say one quick thing in response, which is there has to be, we've reached the point where nothing short of a military action is appropriate in terms of advancing American interests. It can be done, I think practically, from people who write on this stuff, they've convinced me that it's, it's doable. There's certainly problems in terms of convincing people that it should be done, and that there's a lot to say about that, but isn't it, I mean, my view is that we've let the problem of Iran, Iran become so bad that it, we are in a box. We, we've really created a situation you should never get yourself into, even if you're the world's, no, history's greatest superpower. <laughs> I mean, there are things that are really hard to undo once you go the wrong path. In the uh, heat of the conflict between Hamas and Israel last summer, I heard a pundit on TV say, well, look at the West Bank. They're behaving. They're not firing rockets, and they're not getting a state. They're not getting anything they want. So can you blame the Palestinians for getting violent? How would you address that? It, it, what's going on in the West Bank this whole time? Uh, and how I, I would think, you respond to that pundit? Yeah, I haven't heard that argument. Uh, What's happening, to my knowledge, the West Bank is nominally under Palestinian authority control, which really means Israel is watching them closely and not letting them get away with anything, uh, which means it's, they're practically running it the way they used to. Israel is practically running it the way they used to. Now, for various reasons, they don't want to put it that way. What are, the other important thing that's happening is that without getting into the sort of inside baseball perspective on this, but the, the populations in Gaza, which is on the coast, and West Bank, which is inland, there are certain differences in those two populations. Uh, Gaza went to Hamas, and it's a lot, more, it's a lot more kind of religiously oriented than the West Bank has been historically. But that's no longer true, and that's the other trend, which is Hamas is making inroads on the West Bank, and it's, it's it's bringing people into its fold that it hopes will carry out attacks. Now, you can multiply that point one step further, which is the, the population of Palestinians, and it's not a good term, but Palestinian citizens of Israel, so these are the ones who live in the main body of Israel, not in West Bank or Gaza, and have all citizenship rights. Many of them have become Islamized in the sense of or radicalized, if you use that term, which is not a good term either. But they're now leaning towards that direction politically. And they have votes and they run, they sit in the parliament. Now that is another, so that's the wider perspective on the same ideological trend. 
And I think that's the significant thing to pay attention to. Whether they get what they want, I think that, that buys into the wrong view of what the Palestinian cause is about. It's not about building a new society for people to have a good life. Contrary to George Bush, contrary to Obama, contrary to all the presidents who've mouthed that sound bite for, for decades. It is, I think it's malpractice for anyone to talk about that who should know better uh, to spout that way. Not you, but other people. <clears throat> Do you see a Churchill in, in Israel or a, any, any hope for leaders, leadership for, from Israel? Uh, I don't know the political leadership well enough to pick a winner or a loser. I mean, I don't think there are any giants that stand out just from my limited knowledge. Someone you might speak to is Boaz. He, I think he's better clued into the Israeli political scene. What I study more is the, the, what I have studied more is the history of Israeli policy toward this and American policy toward it. And in that respect, there have been better and worse leaders, but no, none who's really stood out. I can't hear. Reply to it. Maybe I reply to it. Uh, in regard to Churchill, there is no Churchill in sight, nowhere, nor in Israel, nor in the West in general, unfortunately. And uh, about libertarians, just uh, it's kind of an internal joke, but if you care to look on Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority uh, Facebook page, you see that he's affiliated, that he described describe himself as a libertarian. <laughs> so, uh, just so much for being libertarian. Yeah. I think this will be the last question. Thank you. Um, Mario Vargas Llosa, the, the very well-known writer in Latin America, even he denounces Israel as committing genocide against, uh, against the Palestinians. Given this, this prevalence, would it be possible that these people are making the mistake of attributing to Israel a uh, misappropriating the land and therefore um, giving uh, reliance to the position of the of the Palestinians to to get back their piece of land, and and of course this is a mistake in history of un, uh, not understanding history, but could that be the source? Because nobody in his right mind would defend the the barbarity of. Uh, of what's happening over there. I think part of it is the, the historical arguments that I didn't touch on here, but are worth talking about in another context. There are definitely arguments people make, and there's some historical documentation that you could bring out about the way land was acquired, because Israel was uh, built from a society that didn't look quite the way it does today. They, there were settlers and their colonies and so on. But I think that is a, so there's a definitely a historical question. My view on the history, having studied it, is that it's a misreading of the history. So the, this, the argument that the Jews came and they stole the land. Even sympathizers with the Palestinians acknowledge that that's not accurate. Even they acknowledge that that's not accurate. And including the, the, the way land was acquired during war. Now, that, that's more contentious. I think that there's a lot of interesting things to say about the way that argument works, which is what's essential to it is, here's a group of people who've been screwed over. And we'll talk about the land that was taken from their great, 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 great grandfather who still walks around with a key in his pocket waiting to go back to a house that doesn't exist. And, oh, what the, the, the human tragedy of that. Now, in war, there is human tragedy and there are refugees. And it's a terrible thing, but that's the fact of war. But the, the, the idea that you ought to side with the victim is a really deep-rooted view in our culture. And it, I put it that way because it's, it's irrelevant to those people, because it's an emotional conclusion. It's not a thought-out conclusion. It, it's because they're the victim, they obviously deserve our sympathy. Now, there's a, there's a whole host of questions you might ask if you were thinking about this and say, well, what is the genesis of this problem? Are they really victims? Have they done anything on their part to rectify this? Are they innocent victims or are they guilty victims? There's all kinds of things that you would want to ask that isn't asked. And the reason those questions don't arise, the questions of responsibility, 
culpability, cause and effect, basically. The reason those questions don't come up and the reason there's a fixation on victimhood and alleged and real and, and overstated victimization is the morality of, of altruism, which tells you not to think about those things, just react to suffering and exalt suffering and, and minister to those who suffer the most. So there's a way in which it corrupts one's thinking, even really brilliant people. And the, what it does is it tells you, don't ask these questions, feel this. And this is, well, on the, in a very concrete way, there are people who are miserable and poor and suffering, and they have a whole sob story. How could you ask any more? Who, what, how dare you apply standards to them? Your own standards, no less. How dare you ask the questions of guilt and responsibility? It's obvious what the guilt is. Whoever is stronger has obviously taken from whoever is weaker. Now, I'm not trying to parody that view. I'm presenting it in what I think is an accurate statement. And you see it all over the place. And I think that is a big part of why that argument has played such a role in the debate. Because in the founding of every country, or most countries, and, and after every major war, there's always people who are displaced and who are uh, who lose property and who become refugees, and just there's incredible disruption. But in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, that fact, the fact of refugees, the fact of people whose property is being taken or is no longer in their control, there's such an emphasis on that. And there's no, and there's a deliberate attempt not to resolve it. The Arab country, only one Arab country has ever offered Palestinian refugees citizenship. And that's Jordan. All the others keep them in this limbo. And it's deliberate because they don't want to solve the problem. They want to have victims that they can point to and use as a moral club against Israel. As it's, a, it's a pawn. Now, they, they do that because they know that if you can point to suffering, you've created people who are obviously in the moral right. So, it, okay. <laughs> Thanks.